chapter number two. Two Peter chapter number two, just in case. Just in case, we will do a little bit of review as we uh, move along. And uh, this is Lessons uh, from the Man Lot. It's number two. Last week, uh, we preached, tried to, to just get an understanding of this. But we're going to read these verses again, get us back in the swing of things. And please, 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 I know it's hard to turn to every scripture, especially when I don't have an outline in front of you to have it. I will type it up so that you can have it on hand if you want to go back and review some things. But um, I, I'll quote a lot of things tonight. There's a lot of uh, verses and chapters I'll turn to, but uh, I'll quote a lot of things. Don't worry so much about getting there. Just get to our main text. We'll be at Genesis after this, uh, which will be the only two places I really want you to turn, just so you have some focus on what's going on. My goal is for us to learn. If you have a lesson that you need to learn from something, you're never going to learn it unless what? You have no idea what I was going to say right there. I didn't expect it to. Unless you pay attention, man. Unless you get a hold of it, there would be a lesson, a life lesson that you can learn from it. But man, if it never uh, infiltrates your brain, and here's how it works. Uh, you listen. There's these gates that go to your head. There's the eye gate, the ear gate. And once the things get in your head, you decide whether it gets in your heart or not. You all know the old saying that it goes one in one ear and what? Oh, yeah. Out the other. It means it never did penetrate anything. And so as we try to learn these, and I hope you do, uh, man, just some valuable lessons tonight. Help me out, and it'll help you out too in the long run of things, okay? So everybody there, 2 Peter chapter number 2, say amen. <laughs> okay, about everybody was there. All right, 2 Peter chapter number 2, look at verse number uh, 6. We'll start at 6, 7, and 8. We'll read it and we'll pray again, okay? All right, so we'll probably be done too. It says, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example of those that should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot. That's amazing, isn't it? That word just there. He is a just man. It said he delivered just Lot. And remember this word from last week? Vex with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Just in case you forgot, vex, that vex means to wear down. And he was vexed every day by hearing and seeing these things that these people did. Look at verse 8. For the righteous man, <laughs> just amazing, isn't it? The righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing and vexed. That means that he's in chains, he's trapped, tortured. Vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The whole reason he wrote this chapter right here, verse 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judge, judgment to be punished. And so tonight, lessons from Lot, number, number two, we'll catch you up here just a second. Let's have another word of prayer. Father, thank you. I bow a need to you tonight, and I ask that you bless the preaching of your word. God, we need you. We read it out loud to give it reverence. And as we uh, get into it and dive into it, God, that you get wisdom and understanding. We need you tonight to help us to understand these truths in our lives and apply them. In Christ's holy name we pray, and all God's people said. Amen, amen. Now, how many of you were not here? Now, how many of you were here last week? Okay, now, just to remind you of where we're at in Lot. We went through these two Peter. If you don't know who Lot is, Old Testament guy, we'll get to Genesis here in just a second. But uh, Lot was this guy. He started out with Abraham. Abraham was his uncle. And Abraham was the father of faith. He had uh, great faith to follow God wherever God said he should go. He went. And uh, we looked at, and through this chapter, we look at the contradictions that led to the destruction. Sorry, man, it's just coming out. <clears throat> you see it coming out, I don't know why, but the spit's working tonight. So you're just going to, if you got to get the shield on, get the shield on, I'm just going to keep going. So, But we look at the contradictions. Y'all remember them in verse 1, there were false prophets, but then there was also those that denied the Lord. And then verse 2 there's these pernicious ways by reason of who the way of truth that the false ways because they didn't know the way of truth. And uh, we looked at that. There's contradictions that led, and that's typically what leads us to a place where we're in destruction, is because there's contradictions in our life. We say, well, which one's right? And we usually choose the wrong one. But how do you know which one's truth and which one's not? The Bible, the Word of God. <laughs> Man, you got to dig in, you got to find out. Hey, is this. Spiritually right or is it spiritually wrong? There's always going to be contradictions. You hang on to that. There's always going to be contradictions that you say, is this the right way to go or is this the right way to go? And they're, they're just clashing. I'll never forget that video last week. Just 
the progressives and the conservatives. And if you want to link to that, I'll show it to you. But it just blew my mind uh, how much they, people nowadays, the progressive Christians, they say, uh, disregard the Word of God. They only want pieces of it to fit their agenda instead of just calling sin a sin. It's just amazing. But there will always be some other thing. You know what's amazing to me? I'm going to preach this just a little bit. You guys gave me a little extra time, so I'm allowed to. But you know what's amazing to me? The devil never gave Eve the choice to say no. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. He said, you got to eat this fruit. Uh, he never said you didn't have to. So he never gives the other side. He just wants the side of untruth, but there's a contradiction. There's always another side. And so we've got to search that out. Which one's right? Let me look at the comparisons for us to realize that God means business. Remember these? Verse number 3 and 4. Look at it again. It says, God spared not the angels. Remember that? There's an eternal. Verse 5, he spared not the old world. And then verse 6, he turned these cities aside and more of these comparisons to show us, hey, now, God means business when he talks about this. Now, remember, he knows how to deliver the, the godly out of temptation. Okay, you say amen. Yeah. All right, so he knows how to do that. He's saying, look, I want to tell you, if you're going to continue, if this is the way that you're going to go, if you're going to choose unrighteousness over godliness, here's some things that happened when other people did that. He spared not the angels, delivered them the judgment. He spared not the old world, but destroyed everybody but eight people. I mean, that's a lot of people. And then even here he says Sodom and Gomorrah. He's just using that as a comparison. Then we looked at this uh, carnal man. Now carnal man ain't any more, anything more than a world man. That's man lot. We looked at his character. We, we tried to understand why. And he moved away. And uh, we looked at that he was a child of God. But remember that he was in chains. I mean he was saved. Just saved, say amen. amen. Now if you're saved and excited, say it like you're excited. Amen. <laughs> So he was that same guy. He was a just man. He was a righteous man. But he was in chains where he couldn't get out, where he thought, man, I'm just trapped in this. But if I move out of this, what's going to happen? And I may lose some friends or I may lose some, uh, uh, I may lose my job. I may lose something. And he just thought, I have to be in this situation. He's a child of God, but he's in chains. Hearing, the Bible says, verse 8 again. It says, hearing, he dwelt among them. What happened? He dwelt among them and seeing and hearing. Vexed his righteous soul. It was amazing. Today we're going to look at concert, the consequences of all this. But before we go there, I, I am I was convicted this week. I'm like, man, I feel like I'm sometimes just a, a lopsided preacher. That I only preach like, well, you're all just everybody going to go to hell unless you get saved, you know, which they are. But I just don't want to be negative all the time. So I want you to realize before, because this is, it, this is hard. Some of this stuff is very hard to get and apply because it's just convicting. As I read through it, just it's convicting. I want you to realize something now. You get ready to say amen, because this is some kind of stuff you can say amen to. God loves you. Amen. And he loves you, man. <laughs> this is one of the greatest things ever that God loves you. Watch. Peter, I think, is a preacher and a half. I mean, he's preaching up a story. You see this? If you go to chapter 2, or actually like uh, verse 12 of chapter 1, all the way to the end of chapter 3, he's preaching nothing but, oh, the Lord's coming. Oh, the Lord's got judgment. He's, he's smacking, he's laying smack down. He's doing all this. If you read through, you see that. But right before he does, he gives him a little bit of, and you know what? God's good. And if you don't realize that God's good yet in your life, man, you got to realize God's good. Yeah. Come on. He's good. Yeah. And he loves you. Yeah. He loves you and me. I don't want to be one side on this thing, but Peter, he's preaching, and right before he does, I would think he wanted to encourage him first. I may have this out of order, but before I preach the consequences, because man, it's just hard, I want to give you just a little bit, just as Peter did, just a little bit of encouragement. So if you would, just look at 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 2. Here's what some things I just want to remind you. Write these down if you're taking notes. Number one, right now, God gives us peace. And you're like, we're going to get some consequences. Yeah, I am, but I want you to realize that God will give you peace. Look at the verse, verse 2. He says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the, what? Knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He says, hey, I want to know you have, you can have peace. Now, I'm going to tell you guys this right now. Every one of you, whether you recognize it or not, one of the greatest things you ever want in your life, and I want mine, is peace. I always say this, none of us want to go home with the people yelling at each other. You say, man, it's all right. You're not going to put too much more flame on me. I'm burning pretty hot right now as it is. 
None of us want to, to walk out of here and see sirens and police officers. And none of us want to uh, get on uh, social media and see it just uh, things going on in this world. You think, man, wars and rumors of war. No one wants to see that. We want peace. And God said, hey, I want to give you peace. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. Uh, Though the thoughts that I think to you, they are of good and of peace and not of evil. Huh? Let me quote that right. I didn't think I quoted right. Jeremiah 29, 11. You can write it down and you can try to turn to it, but I'm almost there. Listen to what he says here. It's one of the great. He says, For I know, this is God talking, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I'm going to tell you that God, even in the Old Testament, He says, I want you to know that the thoughts that I have towards you are ones of peace. I want to bring peace in your life. Colossians 3.15 says, to Let the peace of God rule in your heart. And I'm going to tell you that him, <coughs> man, I ain't done that in a while. <coughs> him and him alone is about the same time every night I sneeze and I ain't done that in a while. But hey, he wants to bring you peace. Him and him alone. He says, I want to bring peace in your life. And the only way that we're going to truly get it, we're not going to get it from anything else but from Jesus himself. That's the only person. God said, that's the, that's the thoughts that I think towards you as ones of peace. Number two, watch this. He's there's some power in who he is. Look at verse three. It says, according as his divine what? Power hath given, uh, uh, given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Realize that there's power in who Jesus is and who God is. He'll bring peace, but also bring power. You all know this verse, Isaiah chapter number 40. You know where I'm going. Listen to these verses. Oh, man. i got to be careful not to go ahead and preach all this. Look at verse 28. Listen to it. If you're there or just listen. It says, Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, this will bless you, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. You call me about 11 o'clock, and you say, well, I need to move the couch. I'm going to say, I don't know who you are, and I'll hang up on you. Because I'm asleep, man. I'm faint. I'm very, my bedtime, way past my bedtime. But the God that we know, the God that I know, and the God you should know, man, he never faints. He never gets weary. He doesn't look down and say, man, I'm just tired today. I don't want to do anything. No, no, no. That ain't the God that we know. That ain't the God of Scripture. It says he doesn't faint. He's not aware. He, there's no searching of his understanding. Look at 29. Listen to it. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have the <laughs> mighty increase. <laughs> listen to this. He says that you are faint. That's okay. He'll let you lend. He'll lend some of the power to you. He'll lend some of the power to you. Uh, Sunday night, or Saturday night into Sunday, I woke up at 1.31 in the morning. 1.31. And I don't know if he just did that for this message right here, but 1.31 is pretty early. I mean, I went to bed at like 10. Okay? So I went to bed at 10, 1.30. I couldn't go back to sleep. I laid in bed, Adley beside me, and then, and then my wife, that's how kind of it goes, Katie, Adley, me, okay? And I'm laying, I'm laying there wide awake. I'm like, what's going on? So I thought it was my dad. So I texted him in the morning. I said, Dad, you okay? I've been praying for you all night. I think I'm actually, I'm 1.30. Are you kidding me? From 1.30 and I can get to bed to about 9 or 10. I don't know how long it was. I'm thinking, how did I do that? I'm telling you, he lends his power to the faint. You think, how? No, no, no. If I was deprived of sleep, no, no, no. God said, I'll lend it to you. <laughs> he gives power to the faint, man. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. <laughs> He says, the unlimited God that has no limit on his power says, if you need it, i got it for you. And watch it. Verse 20 30. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary. Some of y'all can stay up all night and be all right. Some of you playing basketball, football, and you're getting all, and you're like, man, I take you, I can still take it on. Now, just, now, just not past 10, okay? Right, Ed? <laughs> no, past 10. You get basketball game, I can do all that. But the youth, you say, man, I can go 100 miles the other, but there won't be a day you get weary. There will be a day that you get weary, and you say, I have no power, no strength. God said, I'll, I'll, I'll got that. Because verse, verse 31 says, He that would they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not weary, not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You know what the greatest thing about that verse is? God says, I will do something that's humanly impossible. I'll put wings on you and make you fly. A Red Bull's got, he, he's got some competition, right? Yeah. he got some competition. He will put it on. He says, I'll make you mount up as wings. As you, you say to me, we're going to fly. No, no, no. It's going to feel like you're flying when he gets a hold of you. He gives you the strength. You think, how in the world am I doing this? It's because God wants to give you power. The one that has no limitations of power offers his to us. Everything. For in, the, in that, Look at that verse of Peter. 
He says, according to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and what? Godliness. There ain't a thing. I'm back at Peter now. Sorry. First Peter? Yeah, 2 Peter, chapter 1. Sorry about that. Can you say that again? The one who has no power. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. No the, one that has no, <laughs> yeah. the one who has no limitations of power offers his to us. The one that has no limitations of power offers everything that we need for life and godliness. He said, I will provide. Isn't that great? He gives us peace. He gives us power. Watch this. He gives us promises. Look at verse number 4. Look at the Bible. St. Peter chapter 1, look at verse 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Man, I should just wait and preach this sometime or other, and just so I can stick on a little bit. But there's promises He gives us. Now, if I promise you something, there's a 50-50 chance, right? I either lied to you or I'm going to do it, right? <laughs> I, mean, I may promise you something, but I'm going to tell you, the God who loves you, the God that thinks of, uh, thinks of you of peace and not of evil, He wants to give you an expected end. The one that says, I have unlimited power, I'm ready to give it to you, I'm ready to mount you up as wings, I'm, I put wings on you, make you fly, and it may not come, this other will come from your strength, it's going to come from His, I will borrow, let you borrow my power. He says, that same God says, there's a promises that are exceeding great. He's never broke a promise He's ever given you. You know that? And it says it's exceeding great. I mean, just think about the word great. I mean, if I said, here's a steak, praise God, porterhouse, about 12, 16 ounces. I mean, you could, if, you, if you curled it too much, your arms would get tired, right? If, you, if I said, here's a steak I want you to eat, you're, man, pretty good, mouth water, right? Y'all had supper in my hand, huh? But if I said, here's a great steak, the expectation just went out there. And he says that his promises are not just promises, they're great promises. He said his promises aren't just great, but they are precious promises. Psalm 139 verse 17 says his thoughts are great and precious to us. That what he thinks, Psalm, Psalm 139 verse 17 is that verse. He says that what God thinks of us is great and it's precious. Look at these promises. You ready for these? Heaven. That's a promise no one else can promise you. <laughs> so someone's like, hey man, I promise you heaven. Liar. But God said, I'll promise it to you. And when he promises it to you, he comes through. <laughs> Come on, you can say amen. I'll be no preaching earlier if you do that. Hey, heaven, man. Listen to this one. The promise of help. The promise of help. No, no, no. He ain't just going to leave you. He's going to help you. The promise of hope. That's a good one. Especially in our world today. Amen. He got hope for you. Promise of a new heart. Take that old wicked one. Get it out of there. He'll put a new heart in there. That'd be good. Have to promise of healing. You say, well, man, I, I know some people never got healed. How do you know? The day I die is one of the greatest days of my life. So I don't want to die. I don't want to die either. But, man, I'm going to tell you, when I cross over that Jordan, when I cross over on the other side, man, they're going to make some healing. He promised, either you know, in this life or the one to come be some healing. Promises. What does promise you mean? Man, only he's going to provide. Man, he's had some promises. Number four, here we go. Not only he got some peace and power and promises, but man, he, he has some, we're some partakers. Look at the verse, verse four. It says, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may make up partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Do you know what that word partaker means? To partner. <laughs> to partner. <laughs> Man, I got to read this verse. I want to go turn here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. If you're taking notes, write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number that right? Oh yeah, 6 through 9. Write it down. But listen to this. You're a partner. The six, verse 6 says, I have planted. Paul's talking. He says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So that then neither is he that planted anything, that means us, neither he that watered, that's me, someone else that come along back behind you and water that seed that you planted in that person's heart. He says, we're not nothing, but God is the one that gave it increase. Now watch this. Now he that planted and he that watered, they're one, and every man shall receive his own word according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. And that preacher says this from all the time. He says, uh, you ever heard about the elephant and the, the, um, uh, the mouse that crossed the bridge? 
and they both crossed the bridge together. And then when they got across the bridge, the mouse looked up the elf and said, we sure shook that thing, didn't we? They had a little mouse, but you didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah, that's what God said. Look, we are partners together with the God of heaven. The God that can do anything. He says that with, with, that with God, there's nothing that's impossible in this world. He said we are partakers. We are partners with him. Man, a holy, awesome, powerful God says you can have my nature. Isn't that amazing? Look at that verse. He says partakers of the divine nature. Now, there is nothing divi divine in me. My wife can say amen. She said amen under her breath. There's nothing divine in me, but man, when I got Jesus, when I'm partnered up with him, when I'm a partaker of him, hey man, I'm telling you, there's a divine nature in me. <laughs> I said, oh man, that makes me want to preach, so I better just stop. So look at that. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? He gives us peace. He gives us that, that promises of God. He gives us power. He gives us uh, the ability to be partakers of perfect. So it's encouraging to know that God starts Peter starts here with trying to give us life more abundantly, Jesus said. The Bible also says in Ephesians, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I mean, just put that in your brain for a second. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So if I say something, I ask something, he said, he goes above that, then he goes abundantly above that, then he goes exceedingly abundantly above that. Man, isn't it great? There, just put a smile on your face. But, as Peter starts out, look at verse number 9. This is where he starts to preach. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and I forgot he is purged from his own sins. We forget who we are, and we are supposed to be. That's when the trouble starts. Consequences. Everyone has them. Y'all ready? Everyone, and I underline this, will have them. Oh, preacher Agent Rogers, you say you're free to choose. You're free to choose. You're not free not to choose. I just confused some of you, so I'll say it again. You're free to choose. I made a choice, but you're not free not to choose. So you say, well, I'm not going to make a choice. You just made a choice. Let me give you an example. People come and, hey, you need to get saved. You ain't saved. You need to get saved. People say, I'm just not going to make a choice. You made a choice. You didn't get saved. You see that? People think, oh, that's not a choice. That's a choice. It, you're free to choose. You're not free not to choose. You'll make a choice of some way. Listen to this. You're not free to choose the consequences of the choice. Consequences will happen to you and they'll happen to me. We can't sit back. As one preacher said, we can't sit back and sow wild oats and pray for crop fairy. We can't do things that are displeasing to God. We can't do things that will get us in trouble and think somehow that fruit cycle will come to pass. It's called consequences. One preacher said this, everyone will sit down at some time in their life to a feast of consequences. It's going to be, and it is sad sometimes. Can't get by that old Galatians 6-7, can't we? Uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth, that shall he what? Also reap. You and I, we're not going to get out of the consequences of the choices that we make in our life. I still suffer with them today. Things that I did when I was a kid. 40 years old. We can't have control or break that law. Lot's decision in the scripture led him to where he was and also was going to face the consequences. He would suffer. That the decisions he made, I'm old man, I, at the end of this, I'm breaking down. It's so simple to see him go from one to another. You think, how did that decision cause this? And it's amazing. So tonight I want you to heed the warning. Like I said, the whole reason I, the lessons from Lot even popped up in my mind is for this right here. The consequences of Lot. He that sowed the flesh shall of his flesh reach, reach corruption, corruption, but he that sowed the spirit shall of the spirit Read life everlasting. That's Galatians 6 8. You're going to sow the flesh, guess what you're going to get? Get flesh. And so tonight, let me show you the consequences, the losses. All these things are losses. There's four of them, I think. I can't remember <laughs> how many I put down. But there's some, man. The losses. These are not things that we control. Catch it. Remember, these are consequences. These are things that once we put them in place, 
say, well, I did that 10 years ago. I did that five years ago. I did that last week. I did that last year. It doesn't matter. There's consequences. And God says, I cannot get past the law of sowing and reaping. It's a law that we cannot break. It's a law that we cannot get by. It's a law that will never cease in our life. You're going to sow it, maybe we'll reap it. So look what a lot happened. Go to Genesis chapter number 19. Genesis 19. Write this down. You ready? The consequences of this. Remember, we had the contradictions. We had the comparisons. We had this carnal man. Now look at the consequences of Lot's decisions. The lessons that we can learn from Lot. Hey guys, remember, you'll never learn the lessons of this if you're not paying attention to it. You may take this and go what? And go over your head. You may take this and may go one ear and out the other. You may even put it in your mind and say, "Well, dismiss it out of my life. That's not me. I'm too young. I'm too good. I'm, I may not in the right family, but I'm telling you, there's consequences. A lot we need to learn from. And understand that you can't do anything about the past, but I can sure do something about the future. Yeah. Number one, write this down. He had a loss of heart. He had a loss of heart. Look at. Genesis chapter 19, verse 1 says, There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat down in the gate of Sodom. I wrote that thing, I underlined that in my Bible, the gate of Sodom. Once a man that walked with God, Lot was. How do you know he walked with God? The Bible calls him just. The Bible calls him righteous. The Bible says his soul was a righteous soul. He used to walk with God. He walked with the people of God. Now sitting at the seat of the scornful, the seat of the enemy. That's amazing to me. Remember I talked last week, the gate is a precious place. They don't put anybody at the gate of the city that they don't trust. And so here's wicked sinners, opposite of what a lot is. He's a righteous man, and they're saying, the Bible says in uh, uh, Genesis 13, 13, that they, were, that they were wicked and sinners exceedingly before God. And here he is protecting the very people he's opposite of. The very enemies of God. You say, man, people are enemies of God? Well, that's what the Bible says. James says if you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. I can take you to it, but I ain't got time. He's not protecting his own heart. He's not protecting his own family. He, instead, he's protecting the things of the enemy. That's unbelievable to me. Think of this. The unguarded heart leads to a guarded enemy. An unguarded heart leads to a guarded enemy. They say, I'm going to let up the guards of my heart. I'm going to let some things in that should not be there. And when you and I do that, we guard the enemy that way. Lot was sitting guarding the enemy at the gate of Sodom because he did not guard his own heart. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 says that the Ephesian church left their first love. Insignificant as it seems, when we turn away from what we had loved first, there's a downward spiral that now happens in your life. I mean, think of this. You all right? Remember the day you got saved? Remember the day you got saved? <laughs> I, was my, I was in mom and dad's bathroom. Most famous place in the world for me, man. I was in there and I got saved, man. I loved it. I, I fell in love with Jesus. But, man, I'm going to tell you, the day I stopped loving Jesus is the day I had a downward spiral in my life. I started to unguard my heart. I started to let loose of some things because I fell out of my first love. Y'all getting this tonight? He lost his heart. Our heart, which belongs to God, once open to the enemy, will produce wicked and vile things. Our heart, which belongs to God, if you're saved, say, say amen. amen. Remember, we're talking about consequences here. Our heart, you say, well, no, I'm saved. My heart belongs, it does belong to God. But I'm telling you, we have a choice to open it up. We have a choice to say, I'm going to guard it. And when we let loose of it, we start to guard the things of the enemy. And once you do that, it will produce wicked and vile things. Because Jeremiah 17, 9 cannot be reversed. It says our heart is desperately wicked, exceedingly sinful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know. And once we let uh, the guards of our heart down, there's, uh, one of Proverbs says, keep your heart for out of it are the issues of life. When you let your guard down on your heart, man, you've lost it. And I'm telling you, Lot, the consequences of his choices, the very first choice he made, which is unbelievable, led to a place where he let a guard down on his heart. When he let his guard down on his heart, now he's guarding the wicked things. He lost his heart, the consequences of his choice. Number two, you ready? He lost his head. He lost his head. Now usually, <clears throat> some people go insane and it starts up here first, right? <clears throat> some people question me a couple times, and I get it, but the head, no, 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 watch, look what he says. Verse 7. 
This popped out to me. I couldn't believe it. Now, if you don't know the, the story, look at verse 4. So these angels come to Lot, and they say, Hey, Lot, how you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm in a gate. He said, Well, come to my house. And they're like, No, 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 no. Uh, we're going to stay. The angels said, We're going to stay out here in the street all night. If you read that story, Lot's like, uh, No, not a good idea. If you guys could just come to my house, they're good in their house. Verse 4 says, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even of Sodom, could pass the house round, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. That is an amazing statement right there. This one just one a few guys. This is one of the few people who came in. Boy, they knew there were some new guys in town. Watch what happened. They called unto Lot and said to him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. And that's not to shake their hand. That word you look it up in the Hebrew, that is a sexual word. These men aren't looking to shake hands and try to trade uh, you know, money. And No, he said, bring them out. Lot went out, doored them, and shut the door out them. Watch. And said, I pray you what? Brethren, do not so wickedly. He lost his head. He forgot who his family was. He lost his head. He forgot who his family was. He said, I'm so backslidden. He was so out of touch with God that he's calling the enemy his brethren. Brethren, do not so. You ever heard people call brother? We call brothers right here. He said, Brother Isaac, Brother Cole, Brother Nathan. That's not, that's just, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Sister Lindsay. I don't want to do sister, but you know, I just say brother. <laughs> or I just usually yell your name, man. But he said, brethren. He lost his head. Calling the wicked and sinful men of Sodom his brother. Verse 16, look at verse 16. Uh, if you don't know the context, I guess I should have looked at the context. The, the men struck him. They came in trying to get these angels. They tried to pull out. He said, oh, Lot, you don't want to give us those two men? We're going to do you now worse than what we were thinking to do to them. Read the story. And his men pulled Lot in, struck all those men with blindness. And what's amazing to me, look at this. Verse number uh, man, just verse 11. They smote the men that were with the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. The men of Sodom were so entrenched in sin, even when they were struck with blindness, still tried to go up to the sin that struck them with blindness. They didn't care what it did to their body, physical bodies. They didn't care what happened to them. They got back up and they were trying to reach for the door again and do the same thing that they just got struck with blindness for. Boy, ain't that 2024. Get, go up, get get their high on, horrible, nasty, can't stand it, wake up, whole, horrible, nasty, what, what, what we're going to do the next day? Okay, let's go do it again. They search the door. Now, all this is going on, but watch, Lot was a part of these guys. He called them brother. He lost his head. So these angels pulled him in, and uh, uh, these men spoke with blindness, and they turned to Lot, and they said, you better get out of here, or we're going to destroy the city. We can't destroy it until you're out of it. And look at verse number 16. They're going to destroy the city. It says, and while he what? Lingered. Lingered. James, the building's going to explode in 15 seconds. What are you going to do? I'm out. What would you do? It's going to explode in 15 seconds. Now, if it explodes in 15 seconds, it wasn't me, okay? Y'all heard it online. Okay, so... What are you going to do? You're going to run out. The, the angels tell Lot, this city is going to be overthrown. And Lot is so brethren. He is so, his head's lost his head. He says, I can't, these are my people now. He lingers in the city. You don't want to leave. It's an amazing. Once the world has your heart, it won't take long for you to start thinking you're a part of it. You want to say that again? Once the world has your heart, it won't take you long. It won't take long for you to start thinking you're a part of it. I'm supposed to do these things. I'm supposed to live like this. I'm supposed to watch this stuff. Man, one of the worst things that preachers preach on is things people watch, and man, people hate it. We're getting negative. Man, I, he preached on money the other day. Someone on online started going, oh, there's Penny Preacher preaching on money. Yeah, you little stingy, greedy person, whoever you are. That's what I felt like saying. But I'm a pastor, so I didn't. You know? But I'm like... What do you, what, yeah, you preach on something, hey, well, what is it, man? You, you, you think, oh, the, God doesn't have, a, what are you watching? What are you living like? He says, we have become so part of the world, we think that has to be a part of us. And Lot, man, there's a consequence. 2 Corinthians 16, or 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, come out from among them and be ye what? 
Separate, saith the Lord. And I will receive you. We are not supposed to walk, talk, act like everyone else. Why well, do I don't want to be different? Well, then you shouldn't have got saved. Come on now. If you don't want to be different, you shouldn't have got saved. I'm telling you. You say, well, I didn't know that. It's in fine print. You just should have read it more. He said, come out from among them. Be ye separate. If, well, what does it matter what I watch on the TV or a computer screen or my phone? It matters a whole bunch. God said you're not supposed to be part of that stuff. See, Lot got in his head and he lingered at it. And when you got something in your head and you can't get it out and you think, man, I've got to have a part of that, you'll linger at it even if it's going to destroy you. You know it's going to destroy you. God said it's going to destroy you. And you linger at it. Oh, man, man, just one more time. Man, I'll just go one more time. Oh, I just see it one more time. I just think it one more time. I just touch it one more time. Y'all get what I'm saying tonight? Life has consequences. It matters what you do with your body. Come on now, it's getting real in here. It matters what you do with your body. Amen. Where's one name, man? I'll take that one and go with it. It matters what you dress like. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It matters. Say, this body's mine. No, it is not yours. He said he's bought you with a price. Therefore, glorify your God, God with your body and your soul, which are God's. What's so bad? Act like the world. What's so bad about all this? Well, let me tell you this. You ready for this? Act like the world. You may get there to the judgment too. See, angel pulled Lot out because of the mercy of God, but you and I have the mind of God. Let me say it again. A lot got pulled out because they didn't have the Scripture, the mercy of God, the prayers of Abraham. I don't know what you want to call it. They pulled a lot out. But I'm going to tell you this right now. We have the mind of God right here in our hands. We can take it up. We can read it. You say, I didn't know about all this judgment. I didn't know this was going to cause this. You need to pick it up read a little bit more. Y'all getting this? You say, well, won't he pull me out of that? Maybe not. Judgment. Oh, wait. If he pulled a lot out, he was a righteous man. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what. You're going to heaven. He may just let you fall into judgment. You ever heard of a guy named Samson? Come on now, have you ever heard a guy named Samson? Yeah. Plucked out his eyes, and what did he do? He uh, destroyed, he died with the Philistines. He didn't say Samson out of it. Don't be so sure. He may just leave us in judgment while we linger where we're at. Don't lose your head. And the consequences of Lot's decisions, he lost his heart, he lost his head. Number three, ready? He lost his home. Almost want to skip the third one. <clears throat> he lost his home. Y'all ready? Do you realize he raised his daughters in Sodom? He raised his daughters in Sodom. I don't know if you knew this or not. Watch this. Verse 8. His precious daughters. Come out! Give me these men that we may know them. Verse 8, Behold, Lot, this is what Lot's telling all men in the city, I have two daughters which have not known a man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as good in your eyes, only unto these men do none. His precious little daughters, he said, take them instead of these two men. He lost his home. Because of his choices, now his family had to suffer too. Because of his choices, now his family suffers too. And we think sin just affects us. Oh, it's something I'm just doing, man. It affects no one else. I'm going to take this right out. You ready, guys? Our country. I'm going to do a podcast tomorrow night. I've been, I've been on my mind how we compare Sodom to America. I'm going to do it tomorrow night. I'm going to be on, I'm gonna put, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do it. It'll be Facebook or upload it on our YouTube. I don't know. we got a YouTube channel now. Put it on the rock. It's on our website. But our country's sin affects others, too. It does. It affects him just as much as yours does mine. And Lot and his consequences, man, his family, he lost his home. He lost his home. He lost his home because there was dowers in it now. There's dowers in it. Look at verse 14. Lot went out, spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Get up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked his sons-in-law. He had some doubters because of the way he lived. He had some doubters because of his choices and his consequences. And he said, I'm trying to get you from destruction, sons. Come. Come out. And he's like, hey, what are you talking about? 
this God stuff. You're just sitting protecting us, and now you're telling us God's going to come back. <laughs> Whatever, man. He lost, he lost his home. He lost his home in doubting. He lost his home in disobedience. Look at verse 26. But his wife looked back. The only four people to get out of Sodom. His wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Why in the world did God make her a pillar of salt? Because he needed some extra salt. Now, he didn't know. But look at verse number 24. No, no, verse 22, I'm sorry. No. Is that what I want? Yeah. No. Sorry. Verse number, uh, where does he tell them? Verse 17. Came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, he said, Escape for thy life. Look, what? Not, Not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain except the mountain, lest thou be consumed. God said, I will destroy this city, but when you're running away from it, don't look back. And Lot said, I got you. I'll tell my family. Turn around. Hey, family, come out of there. He said, the doubters, I ain't you coming out of there. You're crazy. He grabbed his wife. He grabbed his two daughters. And he's running out because Lot wasn't obedient to God. Now all of a sudden his wife didn't want to be obedient to God. And she turned around and faced the consequences. And I'm sure it had something to do with Lot. He was supposed to leave his home. He was disobedient. So why would his wife be obedient to the same God he was being disobedient to? Not only was there doubting in his home and disobedience in his home, there was a disregard for morals in his home because of this. Verse 33 through 38, you can go read it later because it's the Word of God, you ought to read it. But they go out and they find a cave. They go to this place called Zor. I'll talk about that here in just a second. And they don't want to stay there, so they go into a cave. And he has grandchildren by his daughters. You say, man, oh, yeah, that's. That's bad. That's real bad. But not much worse than what's going on in our country right now. The disregard for morals. Where, where did he learn this? Where did they learn that this, this was okay? Lot said at the gate. Vexed. Torture. Day by day. You raise a kid up in Sodom, guess what they're going to run? Sodom. You raise a kid up in a wicked and awful... It, Lot's like, I, w would you ever dream, Lot, in heaven when I get to see, would you ever dream that what the choices that you made, that the consequences that happen because of the... I guarantee you he's going to say no more. Which is a little bit, yeah, I know. As we walk, yes, this isn't our home. Yes, we need to witness that the consequences of our little choices can be devastating when we reach them. Well, that's not going to be me, Will. I've got it all under control. Famous last words. There's always consequences. Not for the big things. So, well, I got the, I've never done anything big. Oh, I know. But there's some little things that sure add up in the end. Can't wait to show you the down. I've already talked about it. But he lost his heart. He lost his head. He lost his home. Number, one, number four, last one. He lost his hope. He lost his hope. Verse 17, came to pass, they had brought them forth abroad. He said, escape for thy life. Look not behind you, neither stay thou in all the plain, except the mountain, unless thou be consumed. So I want you to picture this. You ready? It's serious now. Lot, <clears throat> these angels, Lot, come on. Can't get you out of here. you got a man up there praying for you. By the way, which one did you rather be? The man praying? Or the man in it? Oh, I preach. Abraham's up praying over the city because he said he could see it. He ain't in it, but he's praying over it. Lot's down in it. Which one would you rather be? Preach that, I ain't got time. He, he, I lost my train of thought. I don't want to preach that. So bad. <laughs> he, he hates his daughters and he goes, I, I, Get out of the city. And he goes, oh, Where are you going to go? Go to the mountain. And Lot's like, oh, no, 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 let me go to Zor. Look at the verse. Escape, look out behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain, escape the mountains, lest thou be consumed. Lot said, oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou showed unto me. Boy, that's an understatement. Showed unto me in saving my life. I cannot escape into the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Behold now, like there was some other evil besides what he was in, Behold, now this city is near unto thee, uh, uh, near to flee unto, and it is 
a little one. So not this big wicked city, now that it's a little wicked city. It was wicked? Yeah, watch. He said, uh, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, see, I have accepted thee concerning this thing. God said, I'll grant that prayer request. That I will not, what? Overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. God wanted to overthrow Zor, but he said, okay, if you want to go there, fine. I'll save that little one, but I will overthrow this one, so you better get away from it. And the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into this word, this Zor. He spared it, the city for Lot's sake. Do you know what Zor means? Insignificant. So Lot came out, his consequences, as he was in Sodom. And he came out of Sodom and went to insignificance. He came out of the sin, he came out of his consequences because of the little things in his life that led him to where he was. He did little sins, the little things, the little uh, uh, disobedience, and brought them out, and he brought, came out of that situation where God saved him by his mercy and his grace. He said, God, you showed me mercy, and you showed me grace and the salvation. This is awesome. Thank you for doing this. And he came out of that, and he became insignificant. He lost his hope. Lot lost his hope in who he was. That's the life of the world. Thus the life of sin, without the pleasures, without the lust, without the sin, the ungodliness, to Lot, life became insignificant. Drowning himself in self-pity, he drunk himself to shame. That's how he had kids by his daughters, by the way. Isn't that funny how uh, even progressive Christians nowadays, and just so you all know, if you drink, it's a sin. What says, no, it's it. No. Nah. <laughs> the devil's brew is never good. Yeah. Never good. And if you think that it's okay, then you're, you're bumping yourself up right there with Lot. And Lot, though he's righteous, don't think that Lot ever thought that would cause him to sleep with his daughters. He drowned himself in self pity, drunk himself to shame, and ever leaving a legacy. Remember, remember as awful and despair. Ask yourself this question. Is that what you want to leave? Because there's consequences for everything we do. Genesis, leave it. Go to Ephesians. I'm turning one last place. New Testament, Ephesians chapter number four. I've got to show you these verses. Y'all should ask a little more prayer requests. <coughs> I probably just want to quote them for it. Ephesians chapter four. We'll show you tonight. I know he lost his hope, man. He lost his heart. He lost his head. He lost his home. He lost his hope. Consequences. Remember, none of us, none of us can say this is not going to happen to you. Every person that anything has ever happened to has always said it's not going to be. As always we mean, huh? I know these other things happen to these other people and I know they have regrets for things that they did, but man, that's not going to be me. Probably what Bob. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 says this, ready? It says, This I say, therefore testify the Lord that ye henceforth not, henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in vain in their mind. He's saying right there, don't be a law. Now he's not, I'm just saying that. He ain't saying that. Who, what, having, under, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. You see this a lot right now? He's had his understanding darkened, he's being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is just unbridled lust, is a lust for the forbidden. To work all uncleanness with greediness. But watch it, verse 20. But you have not so learned from. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and what? True holiness. You see, don't lose hope. Lot lose, like he, man, he had no hope, and he just went and sunk himself in a drunken stoop and sat in the cave and said, this is it, I'm insignificant. I'm going to insignificance. I'm not going to worry about, I know you're bringing me out of this, God, but I'm going to tell you, God will bring you out, but he knows how to deliver you from us to judgment. He knows how to bring you out. 
But when he brings you out, don't go into insignificance. Instead, get your hope back because God ain't giving up on you. Don't lose hope. He's giving you a reason to live abundantly above all that we ask for or think. Is there consequences in life? Yes, there is. But pick yourself up. Learn. Lean on Him. Love His commandments. And start to live again. Start to pick yourself up again. Will God put you in judgment and leave you in judgment with the world? He may. So get out of it. But when you get out of it, don't go to the sword. And the consequences of your sin and my sin come upon me, don't think this is the end. I know God may drag you out by an angel yet, and when you get out, don't go to insignificant. Don't keep the, the, the loss of hope in your life. Get out of the gate of the world. Save your heart. Save your head. Save your home. Restore your hope. Yes, Lot was a carnal mind. And yes, Lot, we got some lot lessons to learn from him. But man, there's one lesson I want you to get if you didn't get anything else of the consequences of his, of his choices is when God gives you more hope, when He drags you out of that city, when you linger and you don't want to leave, and He says, I'm not going to let them stay. I'm going to pull them out anyway. I'm not going to leave them in judgment. I'm not going to uh, destroy the city with them. And then He brings them out of it. Don't lose hope in that situation and think you're insignificant. He pulled you out of there for a reason. Wait patiently on the Lord, and He climbed into me and heard my cry. He lifted me up also out of a horrible pit and out of a miry clay, and He set my feet upon a rock and established my going. He has put a new song in my heart. He can praise to our God. Many shall see it and shall fear and shall trust the Lord. There's hope for you tonight. Consequences for your sin, yes, but there's still hope. God still gives you hope. He said, Don't walk as the Gentiles walk. You have not soon learned Christ. Christ, the Son of the living God, will give you hope even though there's consequences for your sin. Don't go into significance tonight. Run to it. or lift you up. Okay. Every hand bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for the holy word of God tonight. Thank you for the lessons from Lot, the consequences of sin, and what could happen to us if we just don't steer ourselves right. God, I didn't say this, meant to, but this all started with Lot pitching a tent near Sodom. And at the end of his life, lost it all. Just because he pitched a tent near a wicked and awful sin. God, without your power, without your peace, without your presence, without the partaking of this divine nature, where would we be? So tonight, our God, I pray that you touch hearts. Lord, I pray for a lost sinner in this room if there is one. Someone who doesn't know for sure if they die today, they go to heaven. That's you, friend. Say, I don't know, Will, but man, I we talk about going to heaven. I sure don't want to go to hell. And I don't want you to either. I want to take the night. You're in a place. People love you. Jesus loves you. He'll give you peace. He'll give you power. He'll give you his presence. And you make it partaker of his goodness. That's you. You don't know you're going to heaven. I didn't either. I was a 13-year-old boy. Preacher told me I need to be saved. I was going to hell, man. I want to get saved. It's not you're not saved. Won't you let me pray for you? It's all new. I promise you. I'm just gonna pray for you, man. A hard message to grasp, but I'm telling you, let me pray for you. If you're not saved in this room, just let me pray for you. It's all over here. I don't want to come get you. I will call your name out if I know it. All I want to do is pray for you. I believe it. You say, Will? That's me. No one else will pray. It's just me. To be brave enough to put your hand up and say, Well, I feel like you're to heaven. Would you pray for me? Just put your hand up just after prayer tonight. I promise you, we'll do anything but pray. Gotcha. I'll pray for you. I will. I won't mention your name. I'm just going to pray. We'll see you in a second. Father, I come before you. And man, I don't know the struggle. What's going on? I know there's a war for the battle of the souls of men. There's a war. We need you. I can't, I don't have any power to fight this battle, but you do. And so as decisions are made tonight, may there be a decision that someone who trusts Christ truly and wholly and get their life right. God, I pray for these that raise their hand. Give them a confidence that they can't get from mortal man or the arm of the flesh, but rather confidence from the God of heaven who dwells in. Tonight, you've been challenged with it. Don't, don't leave here without doing something with God. We're going to take some time, old-fashioned altar, in the silence of it all. I love it. Take some time. Get down before a holy God. Say, God, I don't want to just pitch a tent 
and then my consequences end up here. Show me, God, where pitching my tent post to stop will lead me to where Lot's life was. He's merciful. He's a God full of mercy. But I'm mercy on him. He's come and been to me repenting. Father, you bless the temptation. People come and bow before a holy throne and do business as we're challenged by God. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.